Dysphagia is often asked in the exams. Um, so this lecture will review um, questions as they relate to dysphagia. In the exams, when you get dysphagia, you might see a variety of ways of how questions will be asked. One, you will be asked clinical presentation based on which you may have to make a diagnosis. Second, you may get a set of questions on the test of choice. Uh, this could be initial test of choice or could be the absolutely the best test of choice. And then lastly, you would be asked uh, the treatment of these uh, clinical conditions. And it's important that you select these options based on the clinical presentation meaning there are situations where the treatment may be suitable for young patients but may not be so for older patients with multiple comorbid conditions. So you have to select and that applies both to treatment choices and diagnostic tests. Uh, certain invasive diagnostic tests may be risky if you have comorbid conditions. It is the same with treatment choices. So when you answer these questions, make sure you understand the clinical context, the comorbid conditions that the patient have, and then accordingly pick your choices. So let's go through a variety of these clinical problems that you would see. So these are patients who are presenting to you with dysphagia. The first is a patient who presents with nasal regurgitation. The second is a, so the patient has dysphagia and predominantly nasal regurgitation. The second one is a patient who has progressive, rather slowly progressive dysphagia and a history of acne, and you wonder why that clue was there. The third is a patient who has intermittent dysphagia, which occurs for several years with no progression, and maybe due to uh, dysphagia occurs when he eats solids like bread or steak. Then you might see a totally different patient with dysphagia who's older, the partner complains of halitosis and often regurgitates undigested food several hours later. Or you might see a patient who has dysphagia both to liquids and solids. So as you can see, there are a variety of different kind of patients that you might see whose presenting symptom or the chief symptom may be dysphagia. So let's go through each, uh, each of these clinical situations so we can decide uh, what is the best treatment, best diagnosis, and, and how to proceed with them. So the first one is the patient, as I mentioned, has dysphagia and also nasal regurgitation. So typically these are older patients who present to you with uh, dysphagia or the partner tells you that the patient has dysphagia or they will tell you that he's not eating well and each time he eats he has a bouts of coughing followed by nasal regurgitation of whatever he ate. Usually the liquid comes out uh, through the nose or semi-solid food comes out through the nose. So these are patients, generally they are older patients, and the big clue for you, apart from nasal regurgitation, is the underlying neurological illness. Most of these patients have either a chronic neurological condition like Parkinson's, myasthenia gravis, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or may have an acute neurological condition like a brain stroke. Uh, brainstem uh, stroke. So for you, these patients will present with dysphagia or regurgitation or bouts of coughing because they're aspirating after each swallow. Second, they will have an underlying neurological condition. So they first might ask you what is the diagnosis and in which case it is oropharyngeal dysphagia. The second they might ask you what is the test of choice and in this case you have to demonstrate that they are aspirating as well as regurgitating and the best way to show is video fluoroscopy. So often the question that they ask is this is the clinical symptoms what is the diagnostic test that you would do 
and the test would be video fluoroscopy. Uh, we do this often in the hospital, so it shouldn't be a surprise for you. So once again, emphasizing the nasal regurgitation and bouts of coughing are important. Now, as opposed to this, you do get regurgitation in other conditions like achalasia and Zenkus diverticulum. Also, a patient may regurgitate undigested food, but they rarely do it through the nose. So nasal regurgitation is the clue. The prominent neurological disease is also the second clue, like Parkinson's or stroke, as I just mentioned. And remember, the test of choice is video fluoroscopy. It is unlikely that they will ask you to manage these patients. Well, it, just briefly, the management is the management of the underlying neurological condition. So if it's Parkinson's, you need to manage that better. If it's myasthenia, you need to treat that. For amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, there's hardly any therapy. And if the patient had brain, brainstem stroke, it's unlikely you could do much about it. So that's why they probably won't ask you the management of these patients because there's no definitive way to manage them. On the other hand, video fluoroscopy is the test of choice. Moving along to the next patient who has slowly progressive dysphagia with no profound weight loss, no serious um, occult GI bleeding or, or weight loss or anorexia but this intriguing clue of history of acne. So what these patients have is they have a pill-induced um, esophageal ulcer, which over several months heal to cause a benign stricture. So this patient has a benign stricture, and you have to assume that occurred not because of GERD, which is the other common reason why people have benign strictures, and I will cover GERD and benign strictures uh, and malignant strictures related to GERD in another lecture. In this one, assume that the other important differential uh, or etiology that causes benign uh, strictures is pill-induced um, ulcers. So you may get a patient who, who they say that six months ago he had severe odinophagia and then he, everything went away in about two to three days and he was normal and everything was fine. Until now, six months later, he starts having some dysphagia to solids like steak and bread. And you might jump to Shatsky's ring and you shouldn't. So that odinophagia is the clue. Number one, you may not always get that because fair number of patients will have a bad ulcer related to the pill and may not have any significant symptoms, will heal, heal with fibrosis, and then get a stricture later on. So the clue of the acne means that the patient took doxycycline for it. Instead of that, you might get a patient who had UTI and took antibiotics for it, or may have pelvic inflammatory disease, young woman, sexually active young woman who comes to you with new onset of dysphagia. One must assume that she had pelvic inflammatory disease, took doxycycline, got a pill-induced pill ulcer, which healed with stricture. So that's how you have to deduct based on those subtle clues that are in your exam. The second thing is, it doesn't have to be doxycycline. You may get this with iron pills or potassium or some of the HIV drugs. So you might see a young woman who has iron deficiency anemia um, and developed dysphagia. So you could argue, is that plumber vincent syndrome? Those are extremely rare. Those are extremely rare and they will give you this clue that the patient is being treated for this iron deficiency anemia. So you have to assume that is iron pills and then iron pills causing the ulcer with, with um, uh, a stricture. Plummer Vinson uh, could happen. Uh, maybe they will give you a barium and a web is there. Uh, if that's the case, then you might want to pick it. But I would say that if they're giving you a young woman who's on iron pills, comes to you with dysphagia, it's probably an ulcer from the pill which healed with the fibrosis. You might get an older patient who has osteoporosis and taking biphosphonates, which also can do this. So you could get either combination of it, but it's a benign stricture. You have to look for clues where the patient might have taken a pill that gives you a, uh, uh, a pill-induced ulcer. 
like doxycycline, lock iron, and then heal with this. Most patients may not need any intervention, but some will need some dilatation once, and then they should do well after that. The next one is the couple presenting where the wife complains that the husband has having a worsening halitosis and at the same time slowly progressive dysphagia and some weight loss from it. So one has to, uh, they might give you a few more clues like that there's a new swelling on the left side of the neck or they might say that he's now bringing out undigested food material. Um, um, and that, that could be another clue. So Zenkes diverticulum is not so common. We see it now and then. The few we see are incidentally picked up um, on bariums done for other reason. Or we might see a rare complication of uh, endoscopic procedures like ERCP. Uh, when you do them, you can accidentally get into a Zenkes diverticulum and perforate it. And that's how you might uh, discover it. Um, but actually seeing patient presenting with dysphagia is relatively uncommon. So they are asking less and less of this question in the exam, but if you see it, you need to know it. So one, these patients, uh, the hypothesis is that the upper esophageal sphincter or the cricopharyngeal sphincter fails to relax when it's supposed to relax. Just like the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax in achalasia, here it's the upper esophageal sphincter, and as a result of that, back pressure builds up, and sooner or later something has to give, and the most common place where it gives is the Killian's dehiscence, which, uh, if you recall in your anatomy class, is a place where there is a congenital weakness in the pharyngeal walls where the sac or the diverticulum will develop. And over the years, this diverticulum becomes larger. The larger the diverticulum, the more dysphagia you will get because it's actually compressing the esophagus. And these patients will present more with halitosis than with dysphagia. But as the diverticulum becomes larger and larger, they will get dysphagia. Now, the best treatment, the best test of choice, obviously, is a barium swallow because it'll pick up. Uh, you don't do manometry, or it's very difficult to do manometry to demonstrate increased cricopharyngeal pressure, even though people might attempt doing that. And the treatment is surgery. This, the treatment of choice is cricopharyngeal myotomy with diverticulectomy. That is the best treatment of choice. Sometimes, because of a poor surgical risk, you might just do a cricopharyngeal myotomy and not do anything about the diverticulum. Um, and that can be achieved endoscopically too, although surgery is a superior method. Uh, there are some who believe that this is a pre-malignant condition. So you might see Zanker's diverticulum in your exam. Moving to the next one is, as I mentioned earlier, is this patient uh, where the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax. And this is achalasia. So if you get a patient who has dysphagia to liquids and solid, if that's stated in the opening statement, they are moving toward achalasia. So if ever you see in your exam, dysphagia is to liquids, then they are telling you that this is a dysmotility and the most common dysmotility that you will see in your exam is achalasia. However, in clinical practice, you rarely see patients who only present with dysphagia to liquids. More often than not, they present with dysphagia to solids. And when you push them, they say, yeah, liquids also do it. But most of the patients present with dysphagia to solids than liquids. But in the exam, if they give you, they are shooting towards dysmodality of the esophagus. And the primary one is echolasia. That's the first point I want to make. The second one about achalasia is the pseudoachalasia. That is as important as achalasia in your exams. So here, the clues may be a little more subtle. You may get a picture of a barium, as shown in this slide here, where you're seeing 
um, a barium of a classic achalasia. And they may say they did a barium in a patient with dysphagia and this is what we saw. So you already know it looks like achalasia cardia. However, they will say that the patient has been having significant weight loss like 20 pounds in six months, which is unlikely that you would get in idiopathic achalasia. Second, uh, an occult GI bleeding or maybe a significant iron deficiency anemia, which are also uncommon in patients with idiopathic achalasia. They will develop anemia over many years, but rapidly developing anemia or it is more likely that you're dealing with pseudoachalasia. And what causes pseudoachalasia? The ones that you're concerned about is adenocarcinoma of the stomach. So remember, the lower one-third of the esophagus and the upper one-third or, or close to the GE junction, that five centimeters below the GE junction and five centimeters above the GE junction is the area where most of the increase in carcinoma has occurred in this country in the last decade. So the examiners are keen that you be aware of it, that the rate of adenocarcinoma of the cardia of the stomach is going up. So therefore, you're more likely to see pseudoachalasia than an achalasia. So that's why they want you to recognize it. So if they give you this barium study and give you the weight loss and the anemia, then they ask you, what will you do next? You will do an upper GI endoscopy, retroflex the scope, and look for the tumor that you're seeing in this slide on the right-hand side. That is a tumor at the GE junction. Mind you, a lymphoma can do that, and other tumors um, involving the celiac axis lymph nodes can also do that. So the pathology may be tumor infiltration, destroying the mind, the orbac plexus, just like it would happen in idiopathic uh, achalasia, or it could be some unknown paraneoplastic uh, disease where antibodies are destroying the orbac plexus. But regardless, pseudoachalasia is an important uh, uh, issue for you to deal with uh, in your exam. The third important thing that you need to know about achalasia is Chagas disease. As you realized in the last three years, the CDC has raised our awareness of Chagas disease in this country. It's always been the disease of South America. It's never been in North America. But since so many people have immigrated, believe it or not, 600,000 patients with Chagas disease, uh, uh, they believe, have come uh, back and forth to the United States. So this is very much there. So you might get achalasia related to Chagas disease rather than idiopathic disease. Now in terms of clinical presentation, uh, in terms of the dysphagia to solids or liquids, the heartburn that these patients, uh, achalasia patients have, all of that is exactly the same in Chagas disease too. So one little point about the uh, heartburn. So if the lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing and if acid is not going up, why are they getting heartburn? So the theory is, one, that the food that's staying there in the esophagus is being fermented by bacteria producing acid which is giving you the heartburn. That is the theory. There are some who believe that it's still, although the LES is failing to relax, it does relax intermittently and cause acid reflux up and that's how you get heartburn. But regardless, that heartburn and that dysphagia to solids and liquids happens in Chagas disease too. So how would you distinguish this from, from the idiopathic type? The best indicator is other tubular structures in the gastrointestinal tract are also involved in Chagas disease. They are not involved in patients who have idiopathic achalasia. So if you have megaduodenum, megarectum, megacolon with megaesophagus, that's Chagas disease. If you only have involvement of the esophagus, that's probably idiopathic. 
if a patient has cardiomyopathy or if they give you an exam, the patient has dysphagia, he has the barium swallow and it looks like achalasia, then they say he has evidence of heart failure. This is what you have to jump at. So cardiomyopathy is also caused by, caused by Chagas. So you have to say, okay, so this achalasia maybe is caused by Chagas disease. So that is also going to show up in your exam. So be careful about Chagas disease causing achalasia. Now in terms of diagnosis, so barium is a initial test, uh, but the test of choice is manometry. And in manometry, what you're looking for is the failure of the LES to relax. The lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax. It is not elevation in LES pressure. That is not the pathognomic finding. Failure to relax the LES and aperistalsis of the body of the esophagus are more important than elevation of LES pressure. In fact, elevation in LES pressure is only seen in 60% of the patients. So that's what you're really looking for in manometry of the um, esophagus. So then what is the treatment? And of course, you would do an endoscopy wherever you suspect that the patients have uh, pseudoachalasia. For that matter, every patient who has achalasia would get an endoscopy too. Now, what is the treatment uh, for achalasia? And this is tricky again in the exam. Quite challenging questions for you. So the treatments are, you can do medical therapy, which nitrates in calcium channel blockers, of which nitrates, like isodyl, is better than calcium channel blockers. And if you want to use calcium channel blockers, the most experience is with nitherapine. The second one, is to treat with Botox injections of the LES. The third one is to do pneumatic uh, balloon dilatation using an endoscope. And the last one is Heller's myotomy. Now, in every patient who presents initially with achalasia, trying nitrates and calcium channel blockers is always reasonable. We start all patients with that and see how they respond. And they all respond about six months to two years. And many of them will say the dysphagia is much better and we may not have to do anything. But after two years, the dysphagia will progress and you will have to do something else. Now, Botox injections, the advantage with it is that um, you do, you're not worried about major surgery or complications of dilatation. So Botox injections can be injected endoscopically into the lower esophagus and they have some response. The disadvantage is they tend to, the, the response is very temporary and you may have to repeat it in two to three months. That's the problem with Botox. So the cure is not permanent. Now, the, the treatment with pneumatic dilatation is definitely effective and it is indicated. However, it has somewhere between 1 to 5% perforation rate. That's the big problem with pneumatic dilatation. So if you're doing this on a patient where a perforation can lead to serious adverse outcome, then you have to think whether you should do pneumatic dilatation or not. But bear in mind in studies uh, after study, in many studies, this pneumatic dilatation leading to perforation rarely caused fatality because the perforation is picked up occurs um, immediately the signs and symptoms are almost there within the first three to six hours so it's rarely ever missed so once it's picked up early you could probably can manage it better so although it's a serious complication patients rarely die from it and the last one is Heller's myotomy which is probably the best uh, treatment of uh, amongst the options we have. Uh, there are only a few trials where Heller's myotomy, actually I think there's only one trial, where Heller's myotomy was compared head-to-head -head with pneumatic dilatation, and they showed that Heller's was better. However, the study is criticized because the technique they used for pneumatic dilatation was somewhat faulty in the sense that they didn't maintain the pressure for enough time 
for the balloon to do what it's supposed to do. And they did not measure to see that the LES pressure after dilatation dropped by 10 millimeters from the baseline. It, the most successful treatment option comes when the LES pressure drops by 10 millimeters and in that study that was not done. So however, so there's controversy uh, between picking Heller's versus pneumatic dilatation. But in your exam, that's unlikely to be the question then. So if it is controversial which one to pick, uh, that may not be there in your exam. So the earlier questions about diagnosis, chagas, pseudoachalasia may be more likely uh, exam questions. And on the other hand, now if you have serious comorbid conditions like COPD, um, bad heart failure, um, cardiomyopathy, then these uh, um, pneumatic dilatation and surgery may be risky. So what do you do in those conditions? So that may come in your exam. So you have uh, this patient with ecclesia, bad comorbid conditions, who's already, already been tried uh, on nitrates and calcium channel blockers. Now what do you do with that patient? Then it's uh, Botox injections. On the other hand, if they haven't tried anything, then the treatment should always start with nitrates and calcium channel blockers. Um, and then if they fail, then if the patient is high risk for procedures, then you would do a Botox. So that's how I would handle uh, those questions in the exam. Let's uh, move on uh, to, um, uh, to the next one. Um, uh, before I go to the next one, I just want to summarize this in ecclesia. So remember the liquids over solids, but often it's liquids and solids by the time you do. Diagnosis, the test of choice to prove somebody has ecclesia is manometry. But in a patient where pseudoecclesia is suspected, then you would do EGD, endoscopic uh, um, diagnosis to make sure there is no tumor and I went through the treatment choice and one final comment about ecclesia is Chagas disease. In Chagas disease the treatment is like idiopathic ecclesia. So you would try medical therapy, you would try dilatations and you would try surgery. But treating Chagas trypanosoma does not heal ecclesia. By then the damage is done. So you can diagnose Chagas by doing uh, serum assays. There is a PCR and a complement uh, fixation test for it available. And you will diagnose ecclesia that way. But the treatment is still like the way you would treat idiopathic ecclesia. Then moving along to this patient who has intermittent dysphagia. Not progressive had one episode six months ago when he ate at a restaurant, had one recently when he was eating steak, and it, when, he, when the food got stuck, he was completely dysphagic. He tried to drink some water and eventually it went down, and now he feels better. When he seeks medical attention, he actually does not have dysphagia. Or you might actually see a patient who's come to the emergency room uh, who's dysphagic. Um, food is stuck, he's salivating, he can't swallow, he's throwing up whatever he had, and that could be the other presentation. And sure enough, you will see the Schatzky's uh, ring, and you might see uh, um, actually um, uh, a radiology imaging of a ring as, it, as shown in this, um, r and the image on the right side, which is a nice ring there. And there are people who would suggest that Schatzky's ring may be related to chronic GERD and not actually congenital. That's a little bit controversial. Uh, but however, once you have dysphagia, which is recurring quite frequently, then you should treat it endoscopically. The rule of thumb is if the diameter of the esophagus becomes smaller than 13 millimeters, so 13 is a inauspicious uh, inauspicious number and so remember it that way if it's less than 13 you will have dysphagia and in that case you can do a dilatation either using a savory or a balloon you dilate it once most of them will have a complete response 
Now moving to uh, something more common uh, for examiners to use, which is again young people with dysphagia, maybe intermittent, and a few other clues. So isnophilic esophagitis is going to show up in your exams. As this picture shows, these rings in the esophagus is a classic endoscopic view of isnophilic esophagitis. However, be aware that these rings can be normal variant. Actually, we for several years have been seeing these rings and didn't pay attention to it. In fact, Presby esophagus or esophagus of the older people also tends to look like this. And I've seen this uh, for many years and didn't know that they were clinically important until recently. It is now thought that some of these uh, patients who have these esophageal rings have eosinophilic esophagitis. So these patients may present with GERD-like symptoms, may present with intermittent dysphagia to solids. So now if you're seeing dysphagia in the young, now you have to think about pills, you have to think about ecclesia, and now the last one to think about is the eosinophilic esophagitis. So however, you may get certain other clues. One is that the patient has other atopic allergies like asthma, uh, allergic uh, rhinitis, or atopic allergies of the skin. So if they give you that and give you intermittent dysphagia, then this is the diagnosis that the patient has eosinophilic esophagitis. Now one has to be careful about making the diagnosis uh, because you may not have peripheral eosinophilia. If the patient has allergic asthma maybe or allergic rhinitis, you might see some peripheral eosinophilia. But in a vast number of patients who have eosinophilic esophagitis, you may not see peripheral eosinophilia. You will actually see the eosinophils on endoscopic biopsy. So when we see this, we biopsy them and they look for eosinophils in it. And if they're greater than 15 per high power field, then, then that meets the diagnostic criteria. Now, these may, patients may actually present with these symptoms much younger than when you are seeing in the adult population. So as kids, they may be throwing up every time um, their parents feed them. Um, they are failure to thrive. Uh, frequent uh, regurgitations. So those may be symptoms as young kids and as they grow older the symptoms become more dysphagia and GERD. And, I, and so the treatment is little controversial. You can try antihistamines, you can try steroids but how long can you give steroids so therefore they're not the drugs of choice. And uh, so the option would be if you can identify the f most of them may be a food allergens. So if you can identify the food allergens like peanuts, eggs, cow protein, so abstinence from that and seeing if they improve is probably a reasonable option. So in your exams, I think they will ask you to diagnose it based on the dysphagia, uh, which is intermittent, and this endoscopy finding or those allergies, the intermittent um, uh, asthma, atopy, rhinitis, things like that are given and they ask you to make the diagnosis. So I think this is likely to be asked in your exam. Moving along, uh, a rare cause of dysphagia, but the examiners would love to see this one um, too which is this patient who has progressive dysphagia from scleroderma. So you might get a patient who for many years has severe GERD that's unrelenting, that fails to respond to therapy, and of late has, begin, has now uh, experiencing dysphagia. So for many years of GERD followed by dysphagia, with certain other clues that the patient has connective tissue disease, like the hands may be shown as, as shown in this uh, uh, slide, or they might show that the patient is dropping things, part of uh, the Crest syndrome, they have scleroderma or, um, or skin changes or Raynaud's.
patient has Raynaud's for years, has uh, some arthritis, has this um, GERD, which is f poorly responds to high doses of steroids, and now developing GERD, as you see. And so this, and so the interesting part about scleroderma, one, all patients with scleroderma will get GERD, 80% or so. So it's a very common GI symptom. There are other GI symptoms that develop, but GERD and scleroderma go hand in hand. It is a vicious form of GERD. Two, the scleroderma involves only the lower part of the esophagus, as in this radiograph in the slideshow, those two arrows, that's the area, the lower one-third, uh, which is uh, mostly smooth muscle, is involved by scleroderma. The upper one-third has skeletal muscle, and scleroderma rarely touches that. So the disease is primarily in the lower one-third. So that's the other clue that you get in scleroderma. Secondly, this disease is so severe that there is no more lower esophageal sphincter. You have a patchless lower esophageal sphincter. This should be tightly closed and it's widely open here and you can see ulcerations on the x-rays uh, also and that's typical. When you endoscope them, the lower esophageal sphincter is wide open, is severely ulcerated, it could stricturize and lead to dysphagia, which is how they present and it is a very, very difficult uh, condition to treat. So the treatment is still high doses of PPIs and nothing else. That's all you can uh, do for these patients because by this time, other complications of scleroderma take over. So you could get it as a patient with pure scleroderma. It can come as scleroderma crest syndrome, so you have to be careful. Now, there's one other problem that you might run into, that xerostomia, which occurs with Sjogren's or other salivary gland disease, also causes dysphagia because you need saliva to swallow. So I think you want to be careful about not misdiagnosing xerostomia with, with scleroderma. This is more common than that. And there the dysphagia occurs, no GERD happens. Here, the primarily, it's GERD patient have heartburn, which does not respond, even with high doses of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, PPIs. And, and when you do bariums or when you do EGDs, you will see that the disease is predominantly in the lower one-third, and the absolutely wide-open LES is the other big clue. So you could see scleroderma and dysphagia in your exams. And lastly, um, this is not a patient who presents with dysphagia commonly, but the x-ray might be there, and I'm just covering for completion sake. So the x-ray that you're seeing is a corkscrew esophagus. Um, as you can see, it's looking like a corkscrew. This is a patient with diffuse esophageal spasm. So there are two, uh, two, uh, two, three other major dysmodalities other than ecclesia that you might see in your exam. One is the diffuse esophageal spasm and the other one is the nutcracker esophagus. Um, this image that you're seeing here is diffuse esophageal spasm. The nutcracker esophagus may actually look normal. It's more a manometric diagnosis. But regardless, the esophageal pa spasm patient may present with dysphagia, but primarily they present with chest pain and become one of the major differential diagnoses for non-cardiac chest pain. It is slightly more common in women. It tends to be associated with other anxiety disorders like um, other anxiety disorders, uh, or the patients may say emotional states uh, bring about this chest pain or occasionally they might say if they drink soda or cold drinks that it brings about this chest pain which mimics which mimics uh, coronary artery disease so it's always a problem uh, to make a differential diagnosis between chest pain that's related to des versus the chest pain that related to coronary artery disease so i think if you get a younger woman who does not smoke 
who says that this pain comes about when she's emotionally upset, is non-exertional, pain comes in the night, sometimes related to intake of food, that antacids may actually make it better, is shooting more towards esophageal origin as opposed to a coronary artery origin where it'll be exertional, it's unlikely to be, to be relieved by nitrates, it's unlikely to come up while you're sleeping. Uh, most uh, anginal attacks tend to occur early in the morning when you go out to plow your snow, things like that. So if you're getting more patients who have uh, in the night, uh, non-exertional, uh, associated with a bout of coughing, that also helps. That's more esophageal because you're, you're probably regurgitating into your airways. Uh, but in the diffuse esophageal spasm, it's chest pain, it's dysphagia, and uh, iro ironically, it is treated with the same drugs that you would use coronary artery disease, which is nitrates and calcium channel blockers. So on the other hand, this is a fairly benign disease, uh, it rarely causes any complications. Uh, however, it disturbs the patient quite a bit. So reassurance, nitrates, calcium channel blockers is the way to treat these patients. You could do a manometry. Um, the, the endoscopic evaluation generally is normal. At best, you might see some reflux, but you will not see these corkscrew rings too. Manometry is not pathognomic. Uh, so it might be useful, but there's no set criteria to diagnose it like you would have in achalasia. So it could help, but in most patients, since it's a benign condition, we just give them nitrates and reassurance and see how they do. So in summary, I'll stop here now. Um, I gave you several clinical presentations of dysphagia. I did not cover malignant dysphagia or GERD or Barrett's today. We'll cover that when we do GERD. Once again, look for these subtle clues and then pick your choices based on the comorbid conditions, which I didn't cover here by giving you real cases. But when you answering these questions, you should look for those cases, those comorbid conditions, combine them with the clues and then based on that, you pick the test of choice, the treatment of choice, and how you're going to make the diagnosis. Thank you.